Well, church, again, 2 Samuel chapter 8 is where we're going to start tonight. And as you turn there in your Bible, if you've not done so already, let me remind you of what's coming up. In a week and a half, we are having homecoming, which means that's to feed the preacher day, your responsibility. Because I know you've seen it. You've got to have seen it on social media. If you are a Baptist, there's two things that have got to be true about you. You've got to be born again by the blood of Jesus and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've got to own an eight and a half by 11 casserole dish or something to that effect, right? It, that's, that's what it means to be a Baptist, it seems like. And you've got to fill that thing up uh, a week from Sunday. And you've got to plan on staying and eating and fellowship and hanging out and meeting people and enjoying your time with your church family. We're going to be over in the other building in the Family Life Center, have the tables set up, and got a guest speaker coming that day, and we're just looking for God to do great things. You'll, you'll love the man that's coming. Randall Jones has been preaching probably about as long as I've been alive. Uh, he's the man that used to pastor Langston Baptist Church, that huge church in Conway. He's the one that God used to build it. It's where the evangelism conference has been, had been for about 25 years, um, it just had a tremendous impact in this area. It used to have a radio ministry. Some of you may have listened to him in the past. But you'll love Dr. Jones if you've never heard him before. And uh, we're just going to have a good time together. So you plan on hanging out with us and being a part of that day. If you forget to bring food, that's all right. Because those of you that are going to remember, what are you supposed to do? You bring enough food to feed your family and somebody else too. And that way, if we've got visitors, if we've got guests, we've got others, you'll have enough taken care of and you'll be taking care of somebody else too so uh, that's how you want to plan on it and then we're going to hope for the best I, I've never been to a Baptist church where they were for eating and I left hungry uh, they're, they're, and there's always been plenty left over so God will provide we'll have to stretch it maybe but uh, you'll we never know you'll see but uh, I think I think it's going to be a good day and I'm looking forward to being with you that day another thing while I'm thinking about it before I move on if you have not signed up to get your pictures taken for our pictorial directory, that's coming up next week. We don't have many slots left, about 10 to 15. You need to sign up. If you know somebody that hasn't signed up, get them to sign up. If you're somebody that's been in a new members class, you're getting ready to join, you haven't joined yet, sign up. Don't wait. If we fill all those up, we may can get another date open for more people to sign up, but we can't do that until we fill these up. So try to be here for that. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 8, and then we're going to go into chapter 9. I'm going to jump really fast through chapter 8, at least that's my intention, and spend the, most of the time probably in chapter 9. I want to talk to you tonight about the loving kindness of God. That's a word that if you read your Bible, especially maybe in maybe a King James Version or something like that, you might see that word over and over again. Or sometimes it's translated differently. Sometimes it's just kindness. Or it could be translated any number of ways. Something like covenant love or mercy or grace. But uh, lo the loving kindness of God is a covenantal love. It's uh, what happens when you become a friend of God. You enter into a covenant relationship with God. Think about Abraham, who in the Old Testament was called a friend of God. And God says to us, I will be a friend to you that sticketh closer than a brother. I'll give you three terms that kind of, I think, help to understand what covenantal love is about. First one is steadfast. Uh, when you're in this relationship, uh, God shows his love and his kindness in a way that is based on his faithfulness, it's about loyalty, uh, it's about devotion, and it's unending. It's not circumstantial, but God is constantly pouring out his loving kindness uh, on those that are his. It's magnanimous, it's big-hearted, it's great, it's gracious, it, it, it's kind of over-the-top and generous. And then the third word, steadfast, magnanimous, and then the third thing would be it's demonstrated. In other words, God doesn't just say to you, I love you. He shows it. He demonstrates it. He acts on it. He does something when he says he loves you. It's more than words. And so what we have seen in chapter 7 was that God had made a covenant with King David. They had entered into what we would call today maybe the Davidic covenant. And God had made some promises to David. Well, when you get into chapter 8, you start to see many of those promises being unfolded. It was not just made to David, but it was made to those who would come from David, ultimately pointing to the ultimate fulfillment of those promises being realized 
in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of David. But, but they begin with David. Now think about some of the promises that we heard God make to David. God said to him, I will give uh, through you, I, well, I'm going to give you a great name, and I'm going to give you the land, and I'm going to give you rest and peace in the land. And, and so now what you see in chapter 8 is this beginning to be unfolded. Now if you've got a pen in your hand, uh, when you re- look at verse 1, uh, I'm going to move my Bible up here so I can get a little bit better light so my old eyes can see. Uh, here's what you might want to write outside of verse 1. You might want to write the word west because you start to see David begin to conquer the enemies of God and God gives him victory and success over his enemies and the first territory that you see here is in the west. It says it came about that David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. Now the Philistines, you know them because we've been looking at them all the way back to the book of Judges. These people have been a thorn in Israel's side. They have whooped them up and down over and over and over again. You remember the Philistine giant Goliath that David killed? Well, guess what? David puts them down so hard, you don't ever see them as a problem again. David beats the Hong Kong fooey out of them. <laughs> and where were they located? Well, they were off to his west. They were over there on the Mediterranean seashore. Uh, then in, outside of verse 2, you can write the word east. Notice it says he defeated Moab, and he measured them with a line. And he made them lie down on the ground. Now, you normally, you defeat people like this back in that day and time. It, you've got enemies that they want to invade your land. They want to steal your stuff. They want to take your children and your wives' slaves. Uh, they don't want any good for you. They want evil for you. Usually, you go to war, and you, you don't take these people and do anything with them but kill them. But David said, the Bible says, David made them lie down on the ground and he measured in two lines and put them to death, one line in front, of, you know, to keep alive. And the Moabites became servants to David, bringing tribute. I'm only saying all that because you might want to criticize David here and say, well, he took prisoners captive and he put them all to death. Well, he put two thirds of them to death and only let a third of them live. You can look at it that way or you can look at it the other way. These are people that were evil and they were wicked and they deserved to die. They were enemies of God and God had actually commanded their destruction uh, many times. And I think God did. Maybe he didn't with them. But nevertheless, they were God's enemies and enemies of God's people. They deserved to die. And David was merciful and let a third of them live. So you could look at it that way. And then, uh, so there's people that were off to the east, and David uh, subdued them. Uh, Outside of verse 3, you can write the word north, or you can really write the word far north, because the Bible says David uh, defeated this guy, Hadradezer, the son of Rehob, as he went as far to restore his rule at the river. That would be the Euphrates River. That's way far away. He got a lot of horses and chariots from them, hamstrung most of them, kept a few and then in verse 5, you can write north there again. Uh, the Arameans of Damascus in your mind or on your map, you can think in your mind Syria, that area. That's where Damascus is. So he, he, he's, he's got the east, the west, the north, the far north, all the way over to the Euphrates River. Uh, then if you go down to verse 14, it says he put garrisons in Edom. Uh, outside of the word Edom, you can write the word south. So north, south, east, and west, all around the nation of Israel, all these enemies of people that hated Israel were problems for Israel over and over again. Now David has conquered them, defeated them, and, and, and the territory has begun to expand. Now, I'll give you a few thoughts to, to, to connect with this uh, some things to help you if you ever read in your Bible and, and, and maybe something might be triggered as you read it and a few theological points and then I'm going to move into chapter 9. Uh, first thing is that one of the promises God made going back to Abraham and that God continued on, you see it a few times in the book of Deuteronomy, you see it in the book of Numbers, you see it in the first part of the book of Joshua, but the promise was not just that God would give land, but God gave some very specific dimensions for the land that the children of Israel were going to inhabit. He talked about how they would inhabit land all the way from the Euphrates down to the river in Egypt. And I don't think that's the Nile River. I think there's like a Wadi River that's kind of right there in the Sinai Peninsula. It's from one territory to the other. God says, I'm going to take it all the way from the Mediterranean. And it it should be backwards. It should be like that because I'm looking at the map this way, but 
you would be like this. It'd be from the Mediterranean Sea all the way across the Jordan toward the desert out there on the other side of the Jordan River. Big piece of territory that Israel had never owned all of that before. Now you start to see David taking and seeing God through David fulfill this prophetic utterance that God had made concerning the land. And you also see the land not just be given, but now the Israelite people are at rest. Because you can't rest if your enemies are always attacking you. They're at peace. They're prospering. See, God is pouring out his loving kindness on his people through David, providing for them everything that God had said he was going to do and fulfill. And, and God's just bringing about through his great servant everything that all along the way he'd been saying. And, and there's actually a little bit of debate. Well, did David ever realize the full extent of what God had promised to Abraham and, and to um, and to the, the children of Israel later on, did they really get all that land? Because uh, Solomon's going to make his territory expand even more than that. David's son that's going to come after him uh, as it begins to stretch out and, and more enemies get conquered. Maybe. But ultimately, from what we talked about Sunday morning, uh, just to trigger it in your mind, whether David got there or Solomon got there, they never held it forever. But there's a, another king coming. Jesus is going to return. And in the millennial age, the promise that God made of the Jewish people being in their land and that being a specific territory and it being marked out that way, there will be a king. He will be in that land. The Jewish people will be there with their king, and they will control that territory that God has given them and promised to them, and they will be at peace and they will be at rest all through that age. So you're seeing a shadow, a foreshadowing of it. You're seeing it being fulfilled, you're seeing ultimately that it will be fulfilled through the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, off in the future one day, but that day will come. God pouring out his loving kindness on his people through his chosen one, the son, uh, chosen one, David. Uh, something else I want you to see here, uh, you see that there's a reason why David was so successful. Look at the end of verse 6. The Bible says the Lord helped David wherever he went. You see at the end of verse 14, the Lord helped David wherever he went. Never forget that the victory that David enjoyed was always a result of God giving him the victory. It's not that David was great and strong or the people were great and strong. It's that the God of David is great and the God of David is strong. And any enemy that he faced... He could stand against them victoriously because God himself was the one bringing about the victory. And when you think about the enemies that David defeated, again, think foreshadowing. Think about what that points to. The Lord Jesus Christ has defeated every one of our enemies, hasn't he? In the Lord Jesus Christ, we have Rest. Come to me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest, Jesus said. Jesus is the prince of peace. We can have peace. We can be at rest. We will enjoy and inherit the earth with the Lord Jesus Christ. We will uh, have one ruling and reigning over us for all of eternity as our great king, just like David did. Again, the foreshadowing, the picture of what is to come and what is to be brought about through the one that died on the cross to defeat our enemy death, to defeat Satan, to defeat the grave, to defeat sin, Every enemy we've got, David has defeated and, and foreshadowing, and Jesus has fulfilled the son of David, and certainly all of that is connected. And then you see uh, this guy in verse 10, there's a guy named Toy. <laughs> He's a king, and he looks around and says, David is defeating all of my enemies. You know what he did? He started loving on David. It says, Toy sent Joram, his son, king to David to greet him and bless him because he had fought against Hadezer and he defeated him. And he had been at war with Toy and Joram brought with him articles of gold and silver and bronze. Uh, you know what? That's the right response. It, when you see the great king that has defeated all your enemies and you realize, hey, the, the enemy of my enemy should be my friend, that's the right response. You go make a friend with him. You be good and kind to him. You receive him gladly. Well, that's what you need to do. Uh, one more thing I'll just tell you here. Verse 11, just to 
give you something if you ever read it again and are, or are thinking about it later and read it again. Something just to think about what's coming. It says uh, King David also dedicated these to the Lord. Now, in verse 10, what did they bring? Gold and silver and bronze. And, and what you read as you read through this chapter, if you read it, uh, you know, detail by detail, line by line, that, that David is conquering, so he's enriching himself, and, and now some are having to pay tribute to him, like taxes, like the Moabites that he left alive. They're, they're serving David and working, and David is bringing in all this treasure. What is he doing with all of this money? Is he just wanting to enrich himself? Is he just wanting to sit on a mountain of gold? Well, the Bible says in verse 11, David dedicated these to the Lord. What's in David's mind? Do you remember the last chapter? David wanted to build a what? A great temple. It would cost a lot of money. It's going to be a big endeavor. David is going forth and conquering. And David sees himself not as one to receive and sit on money, but as one like a funnel through which when God's blessings come to him, it flows right back out. He, he's, he's taking in, but he's not sitting on it. It's flowing to him and then flowing through him. Everything David's getting, he's trying to set aside so that his son's going to be able to build this temple that God has promised is coming. So we're getting set up for what's coming a little bit later. So we're talking about the loving kindness of God, and we've seen how God is showing his steadfast love, his merciful, gracious, big-hearted, generous spirit to David and to his people but when you get into chapter 9, you, you start to see that there's a way that God teaches us about this loving kindness through the way David treats someone else. So let me begin by reading the story to you. It's one of my favorite in the Bible. Love this story. The Bible says, David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Remember that word loving kindness? There's the abbreviated word, the Hebrews, kessed, the kindness of God. I, I, is there anybody that I can show the kindness to for Jonathan's sake? So if you don't remember who Jonathan was, from this whole story, story got started back when there was a king by the name of Saul. And Saul had a son named Jonathan. He was the king over Israel, and Saul was not a good king. He was a bad dude, did a lot of bad things, didn't listen to God, didn't obey God, and God said, I'm going to get rid of you, and I'm going to replace you with somebody else. David is the one that he replaced him with. Now, before David became king, long before that, he's a shepherd boy. He's, he's going to visit his brothers that are in Saul's army. There's a battle. you got one side, you got the Israelites. On the other side, you got the Philistines. And, and there's this giant that would walk out in the middle named Goliath of this valley, and he would taunt the armies of Israel, and he would say, y'all send your guy out here and fight me, and whoever wins is going to be the victor of this battle, and nobody would go face him. Not even Saul, who the Bible says was head and shoulders above everybody else, he was basically the Goliath of Israel, but he was scared. So he wouldn't go out there. He didn't want to die. David showed up. He said, I'll get him. Because David has what? He has God on his side. And every enemy he faces, his God is bigger than that enemy. He said, I got this. So he goes out there with a sling and a stone. He kills Goliath, cuts his head off, takes his head where? To Jerusalem, puts it there. And maybe that's the place they call later on the place of the skull. I don't know, but there was a head that was cut off that David took there saying what? By the way, I'll be back, y'all. One day, I'm a, what I did to Goliath, I'm going to come do to y'all. And he did it, didn't he? But um, uh, he took Jerusalem later on. He kept his word. Here's David that's the victor. After the victory in this battle where David defeats Goliath, the Bible says Saul's son Jonathan loved David. That his heart went out to him. He knew that because of David, everything had been saved. David was the great hero, that he was the one that really he owed everything to because had somebody not gone out there and faced Goliath, everything was going to be lost. David was loved by Jonathan. And the Bible says they entered into a covenant relationship with one another. Now, when you enter into a covenant relationship, it's, it's really the way you would say it is they cut a covenant. And so uh, there's an old pastor, a preacher, he's in heaven now. His name is Adrian Rogers. He would explain it this way. He, he, think about the old-timey cowboy and Indian movies you used to watch. 
uh, those old movies, what would they do? They would, they would usually sometimes cut themselves, and they would become blood brothers. They would cut a covenant, what they were doing. And, and by taking the blood from one man and another man and putting them together, maybe right there on your wrist, what you were doing is you were saying, because people understood this back in the day, certainly Jewish people understood, because in their Bible it says what? The life of the flesh is in the blood. And when you're putting your blood together like that, what you're saying, my life and your life are now joined. That, that we have become one and we've united. And now we're in this new relationship and we're whether we were enemies before or not, now we are friends. Remember what happens when you enter into a covenant? You become a friend of God if you're covenants with him. If you enter it with another man, you become a friend of that person no matter what. Your, your lives are now joined, and you're in this new mindset where you show to each other loving kindness, which means you are graciously thinking of the other and looking for ways to be kind and to show love and demonstrate your affection and care for that other person. Jonathan and David entered this covenant. They became the best of friends. And so later on, Jonathan, he has a son. And, well, that's why this story is being told. So Jonathan and David are in this covenant. Now, now, what Adrian Rogers used to say is those cowboys and Indians, before they, um, before they left one another, one of the things they used to do, and they used to do this in other cultures too, I reckon, is, but the cowboys, they would maybe take like some little gunpowder, and they'd put it there. And if you put it there where you got cut, where you're going to share the blood, what it would do is it would leave a mark behind. You put that black line in there, and you would see it, and later on when it healed up, there'd always be a reminder there that you had entered into this covenant relationship. So you'd always had this memory in your mind of this covenant. So later on, uh, if you might remember in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel, Jonathan goes to visit David. David's on the run. Saul's found out about David, uh, or Saul has turned against David. David's having to run for his life. Jonathan goes out in the wilderness, and he finds him, and, and here's what Jonathan says to him. He says, I am, if I am still alive, Will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die? You shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever. What are we talking about today? Loving kindness. What is Jonathan reminding David of? David, you're in a covenant relationship with me. I don't want you to ever forget it. I want you to always remember to show me the loving kindness of God as I've shown to you. And not just to me, but to my descendants after me. That was Jonathan's last time David ever saw Jonathan alive because Jonathan dies after this in a battle. Last thing he ever said to him, remember to show loving kindness to my family. So now when you get over here to chapter 9, here's what you see. David is maybe 10 years into his reign, and he's got peace, and he lands at rest, and he asks the question, is there anybody I can show loving kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Here's how the story unfolds. Uh, there's a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. They called him to David, and the king says to him, Are you Ziba? He says, I'm your servant. The king says, Is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? The kindness of God. I, I want to be as good to them as God would be to somebody. Now, kindness is what? The loving kindness. Covenant relationship. Ziba said to the king, There is a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. Now that son's name was Mephibosheth, and we were introduced to him earlier. It was very quick, and we moved on from it, and now he's coming back up again. The, the author has prepared us for this moment by telling us about Mephibosheth, and here's how the story goes. Mephibosheth was a little boy, tiny thing, when his daddy Jonathan and his granddaddy Saul died. Now, back in those days, you had a nurse who took care of you if you're a king's son or a prince's son. And the nurse hears that his daddy's dead. Now, you know that back in those days, somebody's going to fill that void. Nature abhors a vacuum. Somebody's going to come to the throne and take over that position of power. Now, what do you do if you become a king? The first thing you do is what? You wipe out anybody and everybody that might be a threat to your reign. So she hears... Jonathan's dead. Saul's dead. Somebody's going to comfort this little boy. So what does she do? 
She takes them up. She grabs them. She begins to run out. On her way out, she trips and she falls. Her heavy body falls on that little baby and cripples him for life. His legs will never work again the right way. So now you've got this young man that, that's being carried off. He's been badly wounded, badly maimed, and he, he's going to be whisked away, hoping to save his life, not knowing who it's going to be. Now, if you'd have asked just about anybody in the nation of Israel at that time, who would they have said it's going to be? It's going to be David. And it took a while to get there, but everybody knew the next one rightfully to sit on the throne of Israel was going to be David. And Saul had been hunting David for years. Everybody thought David would see this boy as an enemy. He's of the family of Saul. David's going to come and wipe this kid out. And it may be that this kid had all of his life heard, if you ever hear of David coming, you better get away. You better run, better hide. David's your enemy. Don't trust David. Don't get near David. And now here's David asking the question, is there anybody I can show kindness to? For Jonathan's sake. David's not his enemy. But he doesn't know. The king said to him, where is he? Ziba said to the king, behold, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodibar. Lodibar kind of means a dry, barren desert place. It, you, if you could, it probably is like what it sounds like. Lodibar. I mean, it's, it's, it's just not, you know, any place you'd really want to go. It'd be in the south, maybe toward the Salt Sea, maybe on the other side of a, I forget exactly where it is, but, you know, out there sort of toward the desert. So King David sent and he brought him from the house of Machir to the son of Amiel from Lodibar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David. And he fell on his face and he prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. He said, here's your servant. David said to him, do not fear. I will surely show you the kindness. I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land your grandfather saw, of your grandfather Saul, and you shall eat at my table regularly. Two things David said he's going to do. Every Square inch of land that owned to his granddaddy, that was owned by his granddaddy, the king. Don't you think that might be a lot of land? Whose land is it now? It's David's. David said, every square inch is yours. Remember what loving kindness is? It's big hearted. It's gracious. I'm not just going to bless you. I'm going to bless your socks off. Everything that's been lost is being restored. And number two, you're going to eat at my table every day. It's pretty good to sit at the table of a king and eat. Again, he prostrated himself, and he said, What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? The king called Saul's servant, Ziba, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to his house I've given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him. You shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson shall eat at my table regularly. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands, his servant, so your servant will do. Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. Now he was lame in both feet. So why do I love this story so much? Well, I love this story because you see in it a great picture of what God has done for you and I in Christ Jesus. You and I, if we're in this story... We're Mephibosheth. You might say we were crippled by the fall. Uh, you and I would be like those that were lame. If we wanted to get to David or to say it a different way, the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, we couldn't come even if we wanted to, could we? 
Many people on this planet right now would even think about the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe the same way Mephibosheth would have thought about him. Maybe they look at him and maybe all their life they've been taught, don't believe in him, don't trust him. He's your enemy. Flee from him. Stay away from him. But you know, God does for you and I the same thing that David did for Mephibosheth. David went looking for him, didn't he? You didn't first love God, did you? He loved you first. We loved him because he first loved us. God came seeking us out. He's a coming down, seeking out kind of God, isn't he? God went looking for you. God came to rescue you from your barren, fruitless life in that dry place, Lodabar, where you were before you met Jesus. No fruit, no relationship with the king, certainly not eating at the king's table. You were away from him. You were alienated. You were, in a sense, the son of a disgraced king like Mephibosheth was because we're all children of Adam who was meant to reign over this earth and we as children to fill it. But uh, he fell and he's away. He was away from God and we've just kind of been the same way. You know, you and I, we're spiritually impoverished, aren't we? Here's Mephibosheth. He'd lost all of his inheritance and uh, he didn't really have anything. And he even said about himself what in verse 8? He said, a dead dog like me. You know what the Bible says about you and I? We are dead in our trespasses and sins, separated from God forever. So what does God do for us? Well, God says, I want you to come and enter into a covenant relationship with me. Remember what Jonathan said? Remember your loving kindness, not just to me, but for my family that's going to come after me. Here's the great thing about being in covenant with someone. If you're in covenant with them, your children and their children can come along and ratify the covenant and join in the same covenant that you're in. You know what Mephibosheth could do? She could be, he could be in covenant with David just like his daddy was in covenant with David. He can say what David uh, had with my father, I want with my father. And so now what he does is he comes along and he is given information. He's given knowledge, just like you're given information and knowledge, and that you're given an invitation and can respond to it. David says to him, "What I want you to come, and I want you to sit and eat at my table. What does God say to us? Come, dine. What did we just preach about not long ago, the marriage supper in heaven? You know what God says to you? I want you to be like my son. Isn't that what the Bible says here? In, at the end of verse 11, he, he says, Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's sons. In fact, it's not like we're one of God's sons and daughters. We actually are. I love this, how it says it in 1 John chapter 3. It says this, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be, would be called children of God, and such we are. It's like John said something so amazing. That after he said it, he had, to, he had to write that other thing. It's like after he thought about it, and he says, nobody's going to believe that. I've got to reinforce that. We should be called children of God, and we are. That's kind of how he said it, isn't it? We, we really are what I just said we are. We are children of God. God has brought us and put us in his family. We're closer to God. We call him Father than David was Mephibosheth, and yet Mephibosheth ate at his table on a regular basis. David said to him the same thing God says to us, son, daughter, Here's a seat for you. Always a place at my table for you to eat. God came to you and said, I want to get into a covenant relationship with you. You remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said the night before he was betrayed? He said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And they took the bread and they took the juice like we're going to do on Sunday morning. And they partook of it, not understanding what was involved. But when Jesus hung on that cross on Calvary, God cut a covenant. He says, if you want to get in on it, you can. This is the new covenant in my blood. Sit at my table. Be my child. I'll give you an inheritance. I'll restore to you everything that's been lost. I'll give you rest. I'll give you peace. I'll defeat every one of your enemies. I will give to you everything because I'm giving you myself. That's what God says to you. You know, I talked about Adrian Rogers a minute ago, that one of my favorite preachers ever. He's in heaven now. He died. He, <laughs> he would say this to you. Um, you know, he's in heaven, 
And he's probably thinking about the loving kindness of God. How can God be so good to me right now? I, I'm in a place that is just amazing. I've got all of eternity to enjoy God and his presence and everything he has. You know, when Mephibosheth was sitting in that kind of same position, he sat at the king's table. He might have thought, why, why, why? He looks over as David's maybe passing the chicken. And he sees that scar right there, doesn't he? He says, no, I'm not here because of me. I'm here because of Jonathan. And when you're in heaven and you see that nail-scarred hand, the mark of the covenant, you remember, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. Father, we thank you for the Son of God that on a cross cut a covenant so we might enjoy blessings of one that once we counted our enemy, but now is our friend. We call you Father because you are. We have everything because we have you. And we praise you, God, our Prince of Peace, the one who gives us rest, our hope, our victory, and our everything. Thank you, God, that for those that are in a covenant relationship with you, you show the loving kindness of God forever and ever. May we appreciate even more what you've done in Jesus' name. Bless you, church. Good night.